This is a simple robot dog with a 3D printed shell and four legs. At the back, you can see part of the ESP2032's antenna sticking out along with a power switch. At the front, there's a little screen that can display facial expressions and things like the time and weather. After assembling everything, we turn it on and connect to its built-in Wi-Fi using a phone. Here's what that looked like. We've got motion controls like raise left hand, raise right hand, and some facial expression control too. In this video, we're mainly focusing on the circuit design. Let's open the shell and take a look inside. It's pretty simple inside, just a screen, two AA batteries, a main controller chip, and a couple of switches. Let's unplug some of the wires so I can show you more clearly. There are just a few capacitors, a voltage regular chip, and four servo motors at the mo bottom. The overall hardware setup is fairly straightforward. Now that we've seen an actual hardware, let's dive into the schematic. We'll go through the circuits one by one. First up, it's the boot circuit. This part connects to GPIO0, EN, RST, and GPIO15. The first three pins are pulled up to 3.3 voltage using resistors. GPIO15 is pulled down to GND. This setup ensures the ESP8266 boosts properly and enters programming mode when needed. You shouldn't mess with this circuit. For example, if you put EN low, the chip might not work at all. Next is the main controller, the ESP8266. We are using the ESP12F module, which wraps up most of the internal circuitry. You get usable I.O. pins, power and ground, pretty easy to work with. One of the pins isn't connected and it's marked NC, not connected. I'll explain why we skip those later. This section is also simple. Here we have two buttons connected to GPIO15 and GPIO2. There's also an ADC voltage detection circuit, which you saw earlier in the app. Now the four servos, these control the robot dog legs. Each servo has three wires, G and D, plus 5V for power and a signal line from an IO pin. Each signal line is pulled down with a 10K resistor. Moving on, from the left side, we have a 5V linear regulator. It takes VBAT as input and outputs 5V through both. There's also a GND pin and two 10UF capacitors. Below that is another LDO regulator, but this one outputs 3.3V. To the right, we have an I2C OLED screen with SCL and SDA each pulled up by a 10K resistor. The screen runs on 3.3V. Then, there's the programming header. Next to that, a power switch and an extension power connector. Down here is the AA battery symbol, representing the battery holder. We'll draw this symbol ourselves later in the schematic. And finally, the servo headers. There really aren't that many components in this sch schematic. Even if you are a beginner, you can totally understand the setup. You might be wondering, why are the pins connected this way? Let's take the ESP8266 as an example. According to the datasheet, it runs at 3.3 volt. If you power it with 5 volt, you'll likely burn it out. In normal operation, EN, RST, GPIO15, and GPIO0 all need to be pulled high. Pins 9 through 14 aren't usable. The datasheet chapter 6 includes a typical application circuit. We simply follow the reference design. About the screen, we are using a 0.96 OLED module. Its datasheet says it supports 3 volt to 5 volt input. But in our design, the 5 volt from the LDO is reserved exclusively for the servos. So we power the screen with 3.3 volt instead. This module already includes 4.7K pull-up resistors, so we can skip slaughtering them again, 
consider them as just in case. Now for the servo motors, based on the data sheet, they need 5 volt power. So we supply that directly from the 5 volt LDO. Each servo draws about 200 to 250 MA. Four servos need about 1.8 total, which our LDO can handle just barely. So this 5 volt rail is only for the servos, nothing else. If you connect other things, it might overload the regulator and cause issues. Each servo connects with a 3 pin DuPont cable. The other end plugs into a female header. So on the PCB, we place male headers for easy connection. Now you might ask, the controller runs at 3.3 volt, but the servos need 5 volt. Doesn't that cause issue with the PWM signal? Actually, no. That's because most servos include their own onboard regulator, which powers the internal logic with 3.3 volt. So they are already compatible with 3.3 volt logic signals, no level shifting needed. Next, the battery. A, a single lithium cell outputs around 3.7 volt, usually 800 mAh or 1000 mAh. I recommend getting one of the with at least 800 mAh capacity. To make things more user friendly, we added a power switch so you can easily turn the system on and off. About LDO selection, since a single lithium battery is only 3.7 volt, the servo will need 5 volt, we could add a boost converter, but to keep things simple for slaughtering, we use mostly through hole components. Through hole parts are bigger than SMD, so to make things easier, we use two lithium cells in series, giving us a total of 7.4 volt to power everything. If you are more experienced and comfortable with slaughtering, feel free to use SMD parts or boost converters, totally up to you. For ADC voltage measurement, there's something important to note. The ESP8266 ADC input only supports 0 to 1 volt, not 3.3 volt. Each lithium battery can charge up to 4.2 volt, so till 2 in series gives 8.4 volt at full charge. To safely read this with ADC, we use a voltage divider. Using OHM's law, we calculate this resistor ratio. In our case, the total resistance is 85k ohm, with 10k ohm on the lower side. 10 divided by 85 equals to 0 0.117 and 8.4 volt times 0 0.117 equals to 0 0.98 volt which is under the 1 volt limit so it works. As long as the ratio is right, you can swap it in similar resistors. To make it more practical, we've added breakout pins for the programming interface, 5 volt and battery charging. The programming header breaks out GND and IO0 separately, so you can short them with a the jumper to enter download mode. The rest of the pins follows the ESP8266 default order, easy to wire and clean layout. The 5 volt breakout comes straight to the LDO, useful for expanding modules. The battery header connects directly to the batteries if you are using a charging module. It's best to add a balancing wire between the two cells. That way, your charger can balance them properly and extend battery life. One last thing. The battery holder and servos were bought from LCSC, so they don't have official schematic symbols or footprints. We'll draw those ourselves later when we get to the schematic design. So that's the full overview of this hardware design. While we close these parts, while we connected the pins the way we did. After going through all this and comparing it with the schematic, you should now have a much clearer understanding of how this project works. In this training camp, we'll walk you through the entire process, from scratch all the way to finishing the schematic. After going through part selection and testing, we put together a table for you. This table includes three key parts, the BOM, BOM, component placement coordinates, and footprint references. Let's start with the bomb. The bill of material list everything. 
you will need to build a robot dog. For most of the components, we've even added backup options. So if the main one is out of stock or unavailable for some reason, you can easily switch to an alternative. We've also marked which ones are our first choices. If those aren't available, no worries, use the backup. Also, we'll send you a coupon that should cover most of the cost for the first 12 items on the list. You will just need to pay for the shipping. Later in the session, we'll go through this list together and find each component one by one. If you really can't find something, you can also buy it from other sources as long as the par parameters match. The reason we include coordinates is to make sure the components align perfectly with our 3D shell. The hardware layout and the 3D design need to match up. Otherwise, you won't be able to assemble it, and that means no working final product. We'll show you exactly how to use these coordinates in one of the upcoming videos. As for the battery holder, the one might not be available on LCSC, so you'll need to buy it separately. If you are buying any extra parts on your own, you might also need to create custom footprints. Don't worry, we've included a guide on how to do that along with the exact pad dimensions you need. We've also listed the mounting hole locations for screws so you know exactly where to drill or fasten. With these tables and resources, drawing the schematic and laying out the PCB becomes so much easier. Even if you are a total beginner, as long as you follow along step by step, you will be able to build your very own robot dog.